Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I'm coming to you with the first Jane Austen July vlog. And yes, we're having a very, very casual start to this vlog because I am getting ready to start baking some things. Uh, and so one of the things I am baking, it's gonna take the dough about two hours to rise. So during the time that that's rising, we can chat about books. It's actually July 2nd. I've already made good headway on a lot of things. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling ahead uh, here on day two of the readathon. But the first thing and the main thing that I'm trying to make today is Meritozzi, which is kind of a pastry that's cream filled. And if you were in Rome, you would probably have this for breakfast. This is actually kind of uh, famous for Roman breakfasts. Uh, the Italians prefer a sweet breakfast as do I. I actually typically really prefer uh, a sweet breakfast. Every now and again, I want something savory. Uh, and so the other thing that I'm planning on making are like these little tiny bagel bagel bombs. I think they're gonna be bagels that already have cream cheese in them. I'm not quite sure if I'm gonna like them, but I'm excited to try them because I do have a weakness for bagels and I like bagels any time of the day. It's not just a breakfast food. Bagels are a big weakness of mine. So I'm gonna get started on the Maritozzi dough and hopefully carry you along with me for the journey. And hopefully they turn out. Hopefully at the end of this process, we have really, really beautiful pastry. Uh, I don't know that I can guarantee that, but we are gonna try. date on the Maritazzi and on the Bagel Bites. I will show you the Bagel Bites. They have just arrived out of the oven and I'm really pleased with them. They didn't really get brown, even though I put an egg wash on them. I actually used an egg wash this time. I never do when recipes call for it because I can't bear to waste an egg like that. And something about it gets in my head, but I'm really happy with the Bagel Bombs. Although you see that the cream cheese is starting to escape on a couple of them. But I'm really excited about these. They're really big, much bigger than what I thought they were gonna be. And our Maritazzi, I was really, really worried about, but they're doing okay, as you can see, there's one. And so I am uh, in the process of rolling these into little balls, and then I will roll them into kind of a hot dog bun length. And so then I'm gonna transfer them onto a pan where they have to continue to rise. A uh, little trick that I like to do is I will coat my knife in flour when I'm gonna cut dough. I don't know if anybody else does that or if that's standard practice, but that's just something that I do. I am hopeful about these now because as you can see, they kind of spring back when I touch them. I was worried about them for a little while. Uh, so hopefully everything will turn out. Okay, so it is finally time to update you on my reading. Uh, the Maritazzi are in uh, kind of their log form stage and they have to rise again for an hour before I can put them in the oven. And I was very, very concerned that they really were not gonna rise at all even when they were just in the bowl rising uh, because I don't have a stand mixer and so I don't have like a dough hook or anything like that. And so I have to do everything by hand. I do have a hand mixer, but that's really not appropriate for anything like bread dough. And it doesn't really bother me. It doesn't particularly bother me to do it by hand. In fact, I actually like that. 
it's kind of relaxing to me uh, to kind of need and do things by hand on occasion. It's just hard when all of the recipes are now oriented towards using a stand mixer and saying, turn on your stand mixer for 15 minutes. Well, I can't do in 15 minutes what a stand mixer with a bread dough hook could do. And so I'm never quite sure if things are really gonna turn out the way that they're supposed to because I didn't use a stand mixer. Uh, and so this is kind of an experiment because I also don't really know how these are supposed to taste, how they are supposed to really turn out. I do know what they're supposed to look like, but I have never had one before. So it's kind of an experiment here because I don't really know what I'm looking for. I don't know how they are supposed to taste. Uh, and so it's gonna be exciting. Hopefully they turn out. I am really, really thrilled though with the bagel bombs and I already ate one and they're really, really good. I'm gonna freeze those actually. Uh, so that's gonna be good to have uh, when I am craving a bagel, which sometimes really, really happens. But let's get into updating my reading. So today is the 2nd of July, and I kind of started Jane Austen July a little bit early. I've definitely been reading a lot of poetry. I will save my poetry update for later because I didn't bring any of my poetry books down here. Uh, but I have been reading William Wordsworth and I don't really know how I feel about him thus far. Uh, I have been reading Sir Walter Scott, who I like pretty well, I would say. I genuinely like him. And then I've been reading Lord Byron, who blows me away. Everything he does just blows me away. I have not read anything by him that I would not give five stars. Last night I read uh, his poem about Napoleon. Uh, and so it was really, really fascinating his poem on Napoleon, because I thought for sure it was written after Napoleon died, but it was actually written prior to the 100 days. It was after Napoleon's defeat in 1814, uh, so before Waterloo, and he very much just kind of really criticized him, uh, and I found that very shocking because I've always felt like Lord Byron probably really, really admired Napoleon, probably had quite a bit in common with Napoleon when it comes down to it. Uh, and so I just found that to be a really fascinating work. And I've often, during my Napoleon project, when I'm reading and thinking about Napoleon, I've often wondered if he ever got to read Lord Byron. I'm sure he did. But I've always thought Napoleon would probably love Lord Byron and would really get on with him. And then I read that poem and I thought, Napoleon definitely definitely could have read this and he probably would have been <laughs> extremely offended by it. But we can talk more about poetry later. Uh, but I did start a book last week, technically before July started, and it was Marriage by Susan Ferrier. I'm about halfway through this and I'm just gonna say that I don't feel like a lot is happening. I don't feel like a lot is going on and it all feels very surface level. It feels very, very shallow. Now, this book is always talked about, kind of in conversation with Jane Austen, that if you like Jane Austen, you might like Susan Ferrier. And I can definitely see why that comparison is made, because I'll say that I do, frankly, really struggle with Jane Austen a lot of times, because I do think she is also very surface level. There's very few details, uh, and there's very little in terms of description, uh, in terms even of some characterization, in my opinion. And I think that's just kind of by dint of the time in which she was writing and Susan Ferrier was writing as well. And they're also writing a bit of a satire. They're writing something fairly humorous. Uh, and so I think these books can tend to fall into maybe archetypes, maybe kind of a wooden storytelling because you don't feel as though they're really full rounded characters in this book at all. You feel as though they are functioning in the story to kind of make things happen, but very few things have happened in my opinion. The main part of the book is about two sisters, but the first, maybe third, was about their mother, who was just a really despicable person, frankly. Uh, and so the two sisters wound up growing up far apart from each other, one in England and one in Scotland. And of course, the one in England looks down on the one from Scotland because she doesn't believe she could have gotten an education there. Uh, well, actually, the sister who is from Scotland is very well educated and has a lot of manners and is probably actually uh, the sister that you would be more impressed by were you to meet them both at the same time. And so this is 
fairly charming, I would say. It does have, you know, kind of a very sweet writing style and it is humorous, it definitely is. But I'm left sitting here wondering what on earth has happened? Has anything happened? What is really the plot of this book? Uh, and so I am just really not enthused by it. In fact, I think I'm going to DNF it. I have so many things on my TBR this month that I would really like to get to and things that aren't on my Jane Austen July TBR that I would also really love to get to this month. Uh, and so I just think I'm going to put this down for the time being. Maybe later in the month I'll feel like coming back to it. But of course, because it is Jane Austen July, I have already started my Jane Austen pick for the month, which is Mansfield Park. Uh, this is a reread for me, and it is one of my favorite Jane Austens. I really love Mansfield Park because I love the main character, Fanny Price. I think she is so interesting and so dynamic, and actually, it's interesting that most people who dislike Mansfield Park dislike it because of Fanny. Uh, and so I'm kind of trying to get my thoughts together for a video kind of in defense of Fanny Price because I just love her so much. Uh, and I'm already really, really enjoying this reread. I am reading this with Svea, whose channel I will link to down below. And I love buddy reading with Svea. And she's never read this before, so I'll be interested to see how she feels about it. We're supposed to check in on Monday, but I have already read my parts for the weekend. We're supposed to read up to chapter 10. Uh, so not too much has happened thus far, but I just really, really love the characters in this. I love the Crawfords who are kind of the antagonists of this book. I am obsessed with them and I think a book about them would have been just as interesting. But I already have some thoughts that are changing on this reread because Edmund is kind of the male lead of this book, Fanny's cousin, and the first time I read this book, I remember really despising him. I mean, genuinely despising him. And this time around, I'm kind of wondering why I had those feelings. Maybe I'm not to the point yet where he really, really irritated me. But so far, I actually really like him. And I think he has a lot of integrity uh, because Fanny is in a bit of a Cinderella situation, let's say. So she has been taken in by richer relatives. And so they very much look down on her and think of her as uneducated. Uh, and Edmund is really the only one who's kind to her, who sees anything in her. And it's just really, really a sad story because you understand Fanny's side of it, or I do anyway. I think a lot of people think, oh, if I was in that situation, I wouldn't take that. Nobody would talk to me like that. But you have to think, Fanny actually has been done a favor because she was taken in by these richer relatives. They don't have to have her there. They are in fact doing her a favor in her mind. And so she has to be grateful to them even when they are being extremely mean to her. Uh, and so Edmund does feel as though he has a lot of integrity because he's the only person in the family that cares anything for her and really wants to look out for her. He cares about her health. He cares about whether or not she's happy. Now I know as the book goes on, he is gonna really irritate me. But so far, I'm kind of wondering why I hated him so much on the first time through. I'll be interested to see how Svea feels about him and how Svea feels about the book in general because this is a book that I feel like I very personally connect to for some reason. Uh, and so I just really feel very close to it in a way that I don't most Jane Austen books. This is a book that feels very personal to me. Uh, and so I just really love it and I love Fanny and I'm so glad that I am rereading it this month, but I am on uh, chapter 10. I am tabbing things. So if you would like to know my tabbing system, I only have three tabs. Uh, I have quotes, literary references, um, and Fanny character moments. I'm kind of tabbing moments where I think Fanny's character shines through. Uh, I kind of wanted to do a dedicated reading vlog all about this, and maybe I still will, uh, but I just really love Mansfield Park. Uh, so those are the things that I have been reading thus far for Jane Austen July. I think it is about time. I'm gonna go turn on the oven. Let's see if we can make these maritazzi. Let's also do a little bit of an unboxing because uh, I have ordered a few things. They're all used, but they all look to be 
in pretty great condition. Uh, the first of these, though, is not used. It is Thomas Carlyle's The French Revolution. Uh, and so this is a historical source on the French Revolution, but it was written uh, in the 1800s. So it is a history that is a little bit closer to the French Revolution, but was not written at the time. Uh, and so I'm really, really interested in this, and I've already started reading it a little bit. Uh, and it is just really beautifully written. I had the sense that it would be. Uh, this is a book that meant a lot to Charles Dickens. It was really instrumental in how Charles Dickens wrote A Tale of Two Cities, and I believe Mark Twain was also really obsessed with this, and this was the last book that Mark Twain was reading uh, when he died. And so Thomas Carlyle believed that historians writing in kind of the 18th century were really sucking the life out of history because they kind of went for what we know for fact and didn't really allow their emotions to enter into it, uh, which I think is really, really interesting because that's definitely how history is intended to be today. You're supposed to kind of put yourself at arm's length from everything. But Thomas Carlyle is apparently going to get very invested in this and he's going to kind of describe scenarios as if we are there on the streets. And he's apparently also going to be very, very emotional about things. Uh, and so I'll read you a quote that he wrote about the American Revolution. So the first couple of chapters are about Louis XV dying. Uh, and so he says this, born over the Atlantic to the closing ear of Louis, king by the grace of God, what sounds are these, muffled, ominous, new in our centuries? Boston Harbor is black with unexpected tea. Behold, a Pennsylvanian Congress gather. And ere long on Bunker Hill, democracy announcing and rifle volleys death winged under her star banner to the tune of Yankee Doodle Doo, that she is born and whirlwind like will envelop the whole world. A pretty great quote to read the weekend of the 4th of July, am I right? I mean, that was poetry. That's one of the best things I've ever read about the American Revolution. Wish he'd written a whole book about the American Revolution like he did the French Revolution. I really like his writing style so far. I do think it's a little bit confusing. Uh, and I think he's a little bit confused in some cases how he's writing certain sentences. It doesn't make total grammatical sense to me, but I really appreciate the emotion in it. And I'm gonna go on a tangent here that I really think there should be more emotion in history uh, because I recall when I was in Denmark, when I was studying in Denmark, I wrote a paper uh, about Ivar the Boneless or Ivar the Boneless and I had also given a presentation earlier in the semester on his father, Ragnar Lothbrok, and I was told when I wrote that paper before turning it in that I was too close to it, that I was too close to Ivar, that I was personally invested in it. Uh, and so it was far too emotional. It was too emotional for an article. Uh, and I just found that wild because even though there is definitely an emphasis on maybe not making things dry, but on making things as factual as possible here in the States, but I don't think you would ever choose to write something here in your history degree or otherwise, if you were just a historian writing a book, I don't think you choose to write something that means nothing to you. I think you get into it because you were already emotionally invested, because you're a little bit in love with somebody, a little bit in love with a historical figure. And I think, frankly, it shines through in a lot of historical nonfiction. I can tell when the historian is really invested in things, is really, really close to the figure that they're talking about. And I really appreciate it uh, because I think there should be an emotional aspect to history. And I don't like the more kind of doctoral at arm's length, philosophical kind of science of history. And neither did Thomas Carlyle, so I get the sense he and I are gonna get along. Nothing moves me more than history. History makes me happy, history makes me sad. You know, history really makes you feel emotions, makes you feel passion. And what's the point of experiencing those emotions if you don't share them when you are talking about it. Uh, and so that's kind of the problem I have with modern history. And apparently it's a problem that has existed for many centuries and that Thomas Carlyle had a problem with. That's why I think I love historical fiction. Historical fiction allows you to feel emotion, allows you to feel 
real human attachment to people. Uh, and good nonfiction will do that too, often because the author is very, very close to that subject matter and has fallen a little bit in love with it. Uh, and so I just really agree with the impetus for this. I agree with his reasoning behind writing it and how he wrote it. So I am just pumped about this. I also have another book on the French Revolution that I got used and I'm really excited because it looks brand new. That's Edmund Burke's Reflections on the Revolution in France. And this was written at the exact same time as the French Revolution. I think it was initially published in 1790. So prior to the terror, which is really fascinating. Apparently it went out of date rather quickly. But this is one that has always been a very controversial piece of historiography. And it was very controversial at the time. I believe Mary Wollstonecraft hated this. Uh, and so I expect to have a lot of problems with it because I think Edmund Burke was a very conservative politician and he very much didn't agree with the revolution in France even prior to it taking a very violent turn because I believe he also advocated for peace with the colonists during the American Revolution. Uh, so he's somebody who was not really into revolutions, didn't really get what they were all about. Uh, and so I don't expect to feel the emotional tug in this, but I expect to like cry while reading Thomas Carlyle's and I am really looking forward to it. I would like to read this one first, but since I've already started Thomas Carlyle's, I really wanna continue on with that but I've recently read a more recently published nonfiction on the French Revolution. Uh, and so I'd like to do a video on kind of the changing attitudes of English scholarship on the French Revolution. I have yet to dive into French scholarship on the French Revolution, but that is going to be uh, a real rabbit hole. I'm gonna save that for another day, but I expect that I will also really get into that. Something else I picked up was a Penguin Great Ideas edition of Plato's The Symposium. I've always thought I wouldn't like this, and thus I've never tried it. I've actually never read any Plato. Uh, and I think I might like this because Percy Shelley really liked it, and he had his own translation of this, and I believe they are discussing love. It's very, very short, and I think I can probably get through it pretty quickly. Apparently, there's no introduction or notes with this, uh, so hopefully I don't feel like I need any, but this is another one that I picked up. I also picked up the poetry of W.B. Yeats, and I just have the feeling that I will probably really like him, Yeats, if I'm saying that correctly, is from Ireland. Uh, and so a lot of his poetry has to do with kind of Irish history and myths and legends of Ireland, which I think is really exciting and I think will work really well for me in poetry. I'm really looking forward to trying him. He is a more modern poet, so I expect to struggle a little bit. I really struggle with um, blank verse poetry uh, and things like that that don't have like a set meter that is a really hard thing to wrap my brain around and I genuinely don't enjoy it as much. Uh, so I think some of his is written in blank verse, but some of it is written in kind of an older form of poetry with iambic pentameter and stuff like that, which is where I'm very comfortable. So I'm really excited about this. This is the really beautiful Penguin Modern Classics edition uh, and I am looking forward to getting started on this. I also picked up the brick that is the Josephine B trilogy by Sandra Gulland. Look at this. I mean, it's something like 2,000 pages. I'll tell you how long it is. Uh, it's only 1,200 pages. How, why did I think it was 2,000? It's only 1,200. But this is three books contained in one, and this is, of course, about Josephine Bonaparte. And it's from her perspective, I believe. I think it's kind of written in diary entry. And I'll tell you, I don't have a very high opinion of Josephine. Uh, when I read that Napoleon biography at the start of the year, Josephine did not come off very well at all. We often think that Josephine and Napoleon were kind of this great love match in history. And it was really shocking to me to learn that Napoleon certainly felt more for her than she did for him initially. So she was cheating on him left, right, and center very early on uh, in his kind of political career. And I just found it strange. I just found it strange. She's been married before and I just found it so odd that she would marry somebody like that, that you would marry somebody for some kind of legitimacy, you would assume, after the French Revolution and then you would play around on them like that when you know that they're in love with you. And so I imagine that she had some real hostile feelings towards Napoleon, but then eventually when Napoleon wised up to what was going on, he says, you know what? you don't mean anything to me anymore because now I know exactly what you are. That's when then she started to fall a little bit in love with him. 
Uh, and so I just wonder what it was about Napoleon Young that didn't vibe with her. I wonder why she agreed to marry him. Like, I just really would like to see things from her perspective because I don't have a very high opinion of her. I don't see what went through her mind very clearly. Uh, and so I am willing to give this a shot. I really hope it endears me to her. I know that it will. Uh, because that was certainly Napoleon's biography, and the point of it was not to glorify Josephine, but to glorify Napoleon, and so that was definitely achieved. You walked out of that book liking Napoleon, despite everything he did, but you don't have a real great appreciation of Josephine, in my opinion, and so I am looking forward to this. It's going to take me a really, really long time, but this has been added to my Napoleon TBR for the year. I also got Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert uh, because I'm just really intrigued by this. A lot of people compare this to The Sorrows of Young Werther, and I'm really interested to know why the two were talked about in conjunction like that. If they just kind of deal with similar themes, I'm not quite sure, or if they're just kind of similar in tone. Uh, so this is one that's actually rather short, so I am looking forward to trying this. I hate that I got the movie edition. I hate that I got the movie edition of the book, but uh, what can you say? I'm definitely gonna give this a try, and I have a good feeling about it. I really do. Uh, so hopefully this is one that I really enjoy. Last but not least, this was a real score, and I have never in my life felt the pull to read this book, but a lot of people apparently picked it up for Ancient Sathon last month and plowed through it, and I've seen a lot of people read this this year anyway and really enjoyed it, and so I thought maybe it's time to kick this off of the lifetime bucket list in terms of reading, and that's Don Quixote. This is a big, big book, and it's often called the first novel. Uh, so I am, I'm tentatively excited about this. I don't know that I will really care for the humor. I don't know that it's gonna be my kind of humor, but I do think on the whole, I will like the actual story. But having just read The Idiot by Dostoevsky, Don Quixote was referenced so many times, and Don Quixote was referenced in conjunction with the main character of that book. Uh, and so I think you were meant to kind of walk away from that book thinking there was a connection between Prince Mishkin, the main character, and Don Quixote, and I really loved Prince Mishkin. Uh, so maybe there is going to be something there for me in Don Quixote. Uh, I don't know when I will get to this, and maybe it will have to be something that I buddy read with somebody because I'm gonna need some kind of motivation to get through this, but this is definitely not one that I will pick up for a few months at least. So we're back in the regular vlog spot. Uh, I cannot believe how good the Maritazzi turned out, but they were extremely, extremely kind of heavy. I don't wanna say rich because it didn't feel very rich. It really didn't feel very sweet at all, but half of one was enough for me. Uh, it was really, really good. I'm really glad I did it. So now I need to be thinking about the next thing that I'm going to experiment with. Uh, so hopefully I can do some more baking experiments this Jane Austen July, but I thought I would wrap up the vlog here. I know I said that I was going to give you a poetry update, but I think that I'm just gonna hold off on that and maybe make my next vlog kind of center around the poetry. I've actually read a fair few books this week, but they don't all have something to do with Jane Austen July, so I didn't really want to include them in a Jane Austen July vlog. But I have been making progress on uh, Mansfield Park. Uh, so I am now, I think, in volume two. I'm exactly at volume two. I just read the chapters where they were kind of in the lead up to the play. And I know a lot of people this month are actually reading Lover's Vows, which is the play that they were supposed to put on in Mansfield Park. And I'm kind of curious now to read it for myself uh, to see if that kind of adds anything to the chapters about the play, but uh, I am really enjoying this. I love the Crawfords, as I said earlier, and I know, I think I said earlier too, that Edmund was kind of growing on me, but I didn't really realize what about him irritated me so much the first time I read this, but he's starting to move into that phase now, I feel. 
But overall, I'm really glad that I chose to reread this this month because it almost feels a bit like reading it for the first time. I feel like I'm noticing things about it that I didn't notice the first time that I read it, if that makes any sense. So I'm really, really thrilled about this and I'm really looking forward to reading more of it. And I'm really glad to be buddy reading it with Svea. I think Svea is really enjoying it so far and I'm so glad because I know this is hit or miss for some people. So I did decide to DNF marriage. I just think that I'm gonna be happier for it in the long run. And I honestly think it's probably a permanent DNF. I wasn't nearly enough invested in it to feel as though I might wanna come back to it one day. It's not as if I feel like I need to see the story out at all, which is a shame. So basically the first read of Jane Austen July was a bit of a failure. But because I DNF'd that, I decided to move on to another book on my TBR this month, which is Evelina by Francis Burney. And I have so many mixed opinions about this. On the one hand, I'm really enjoying it. On the other, it kind of leaves my head when I'm not reading it. When I sat down to film this vlog update, I thought to myself, I know there's a book that I should be talking about. There's a book I've started, but what is it? And it was Evelina. So I mean that fast, when the book is set down, I'm not really thinking about it. I'm not really eager to get back into it. But this is one that I think you can definitely see the influence it had on Jane Austen because one of the characters is named Willoughby and another of the characters is named Brandon. And so this definitely had some kind of influence on Sense and Sensibility because what are the odds of that? The two names being the same. And so I definitely think this is one that she probably read and really enjoyed and that she wanted to pull from uh, for her own writing. And I really like the main character of Evelina, but I also kind of have to question the format of this novel. This is an epistolary novel, which typically works very well for me, but I almost don't think this book should have been an epistolary novel because it is told probably 80%, 90% by Evelina herself. It's very rarely that you get an interlude from another character. And so it almost feels to me like she should have just committed to this and wrote it as a first person novel from Evelina's perspective. But the information conveyed from the other characters in their letters is actually really pertinent information that you couldn't get anywhere else. And so it does kind of feel as though I'm very torn on how I feel about the book. I think overall, I'm probably going to give it three stars. I'm over halfway through right now, and I feel certain that I can finish it fairly quickly because it is very compulsively readable. It's very easily readable. It doesn't feel dense at all. But I do think overall, my overall feelings for this can be summed up by saying it's just okay. I don't know that it's a book when I finish it that is going to be a book that I recommend to a lot of people or even that it would be a book that I ever cared to return to. And that's, you know what, that's 90% of the books you read. 90% of the books you read are just okay. They're fairly forgettable. But it's not always fun to be reading a book when you know that's the experience, when you know that you're gonna come away from it with those feelings. And so I hate that I feel this way about Evelina. Maybe the ending will really pull things together for me and I'll really, really love it. But right now it's good, but not great. So I'm going to end the vlog here. I would love to know how your Jane Austen July is going down below and if you have been baking anything interesting lately, but that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.